If you were there last Sunday, we began uh, a new series um, in this season of Advent. We have just started, um, this is the second week, and Advent is the four Sundays leading up to Christmas, uh, where we just pause, uh, Christians all over the world just pause and, and reflect upon the beauty of what it means for God to become man, to take on the, the form and shape of man and then come down upon earth and, and restrict himself to a womb of a woman. And, and it's so beautiful and it needs this time for us to pause and just reflect on that beauty. The series that we've, we've, we've started last uh, Sunday is called Conversations, The Jesus Way. Uh, we've been looking at the various conversations that Jesus had during his time on earth. Why are we doing this? We're doing this so that we ourselves can grow in having some real conversations with our friends. Real conversations that share the joy, uh, the hope, the love that Christ offers, uh, especially during the season of Christmas. And we really want to grow in that. So we're looking at um, these conversations that Jesus had. Last week, Anand took us through this conversation uh, that Jesus had with a woman uh, called Mary Magdalene. And we saw how Jesus brought empathy, purpose, and hope into this conversation. And, and we, we saw the need for these three in, in the conversations that we have uh, with our friends. The world is lacking these things, empathy, purpose, and hope. Uh, if you missed that talk, it's available online. You can, you can find it on our website, YouTube, and all the channels. Uh, the link is on your booklet. Today, we're going to be looking at the second conversation, which is Jesus' conversation with a centurion in the Roman army. Uh, to give a little context, a centurion was in charge of 100 men, as the name would suggest. In many, in many ways, the centurions were the real professionals of the army. They got their position not because of their family connections or anything, but because of their sheer military prowess. So, so in the society, they, they had a certain level of stature. Um, during this time, uh, the, the followers of Jesus uh, were being politically ruled by Rome. And uh, the centurions were also placed in these Roman provinces to ensure the political peace uh, is kept in these regions. Yeah, so this, Jesus has a conversation with one such centurion in the Roman army. That's the context. I'll request Taru to read the passage. It's on your booklet. Uh, for people on Zoom, it'll come up on the screen. Uh, Matthew 8, 5 to 13. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. This is God's word. Man, thank you, Taru. This passage says Jesus was marveled at someone's faith. Can you believe it? Jesus, God himself, is marveled at someone's faith. What is this faith that marveled Jesus? Um, what is this faith that Jesus didn't find in his own Israel? Even as we aim to have these conversations, uh, which you might find on your 
table, um, you will see that the second half of the conversations is faith related. And oftentimes these things are tricky, right? We, we recognize um, the difficulty of these. We recognize um, our own fears with this. So my goal is, even as we look at this faith conversation that Jesus had, at which he was marveled, there'll be something for us to pick up uh, that, will, that will free us, that will fill us with boldness to have these conversations. Yeah, that's, that's the goal for today. Um, let's just pray before we dive straight in. Jesus, we want to thank you because you became man. And since you became man, Lord, you know what we go through much more than anyone else. This morning, Jesus, you know where we, each of us are. You know where each of our hearts are. Uh, you know that the season uh, that we are in. Lord, even as we uh, dig into your word, may your word fill our hearts with boldness. Uh, may, may your word remove any lack of motivation that we might experience, any indifference that we might experience uh, towards having uh, these conversations, uh, this, the, the, towards the privilege of having these conversations here on earth. We surrender to you, um, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. The three things that we're going to be looking at uh, this morning is Jesus is for all. Second thing is, Jesus has authority over all. The third thing is, how does his authority help us all? Yeah, Jesus is for all. Jesus has authority over all. Third thing is, how does his authority help us all? First thing, um, we see that in the story when, when the centurion comes. The centurion is essentially a non-Jew. He wasn't... Uh, he wasn't their kind of people. He wasn't uh, part of the nation that God in his sovereignty picked to bring Jesus through. He, he, they would call people like that Gentiles. And when he comes to Jesus, Jesus is not asking his background story or anything. He's not asking any more follow-up questions. The moment the centurion says, my servant is sick, he needs to be healed, the first thing Jesus says is, I will come and heal him. Let me put this in context. In Jesus' days, Jews didn't do that. They never willingly engaged with Gentiles, leave alone go to their homes. The Jews believed that the Messiah, the Messiah was to come, was solely to bring them freedom from, from these political powers. That's what the Jews believed. And, and they really didn't engage with these Gentiles. They, they didn't even see them in a favorable light. So Jesus, the first thing he says to this centurion, to this non-Jew, to this foreigner, I will come and heal him. The second thing, if you see in verse 11, Jesus is saying, I will tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is talking about that glorious future in heaven uh, that, that awaits us all as followers of Jesus. And Jesus is saying, not just from here, not just from Israel, many will come from east and west. That includes us. We have come, right? So Jesus is for everyone, irrespective of their nationality, creed, caste, class, whatever it is. Now, this is not new information for us. Right? This, we know this. But we functionally live as if this is not true. Why do I say that? This very story is also accounted by an other Gentile doctor called Luke. Uh, when he writes this story, he, he's, he's writing this from his perspective and he brings, he adds a very interesting detail to the story. He says, the this, this centurion had a bunch of Jewish leaders represent him to Jesus. He says, when, when they came to Jesus, uh, the, the Jewish leaders pleaded with Jesus and said, this man deserves to have you do this. Because he loves our nation and he has built our synagogue. This man deserves to have you do this. Right? Look at them and, and look at them. What, what are they essentially saying here? He did all this for us. He's on our side. 
so he deserves your miracle. He deserves, he deserves your time. He's worthy of it. Inherent in what they are seeing is the fact that some people are not deserving of Jesus' miracle. Some people are not deserving of Jesus' time. Guys, when we look at our friends and colleagues, if we have to be really honest to ourselves, I can already hear smiles. We do feel that some people are not really, it's okay, I mean, it's okay if they're not saved. Like, it, it, they're not good enough for Jesus. They're not, we, we personally don't prefer them coming with us to heaven. I mean, I'm being blatantly honest because, because of our own uh, hatred or, or, or we, our own uh, disliking towards them. We, we definitely feel some people are not worthy of Jesus. And, and look at these Jewish leaders. What was the ground on which they were saying this? He loves our nation. He built this synagogue for us to worship. He did these all good things for us. So he deserves your miracle. So you do this for him. When we're seeing this, at one level, we are also seeing that we ourselves are worthy of Jesus. He saved us because we are worthy. Some people are not, but we are worthy. We know that this is not true, but in the way we live our lives, but in the way we construct our lives, we live as if we are worthy to have Jesus save us. But the centurion in this passage, the non-Jew, the Gentile is reminding us, he's saying here, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Look at this, the Jewish leaders are saying this guy is worthy. The centurion is saying, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. And, and he rightly says this. The reason why Jesus is for all is because no one is worthy of Jesus. Absolutely no one is worthy of him. Each of us, we are all sick, broken, messed up people who are absolutely unworthy to have Jesus save us. So now, how does this realization that we are unworthy impact our evangelism? Allow me to present two cases. The first case, we have a lack of rupees deposited into our account as our remuneration. We have really worked and labored for it day and night. It's an amount that we deserve for our labor. Every rupee is reeking of our blood, sweat, and tears. That's case one. Case two, we have a lack which is deposited into our account as a gift. We don't deserve this. We just received it. What, in which case, are, are we more likely to be more generous with the money? In which case are we more likely to share and give freely? I'm assuming it's the second case. When we feel we are worthy of something, sharing that thing becomes a challenge. When we feel we are unworthy of something, hey, I am I'm, I'm not worthy of Jesus. I am not worthy of him. And I really want you to know what it feels like. Do you want to know about him? Because we receive freely, we also share freely. Is it possible that one of the reasons why we don't feel motivated enough, um, is it possible that the reason for our indifference is because somewhere deep down we feel we're worthy of what we've received. Friends, the centurion is reminding us we are not. So if, if in, this morning, if we're looking at our list of friends and seeing, hey, I don't see one guy who's ready for this conversation. I don't see one person who will be receptive. Let's not forget that Jesus saved us at a time when we were not good and ready for us receiving him. While we were still sinners, Christ saved us. So if you're looking at your list of friends and saying they won't be receptive to this, I don't want to have this conversation, think twice. We are unworthy. We are unworthy. Let us share that. 
The second thing the centurion goes on to say, and the second point we're looking at, is Jesus has authority over all. Look at what he's saying. But only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go and he goes, and another, come and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does that. He's saying, you are a man under authority. You can see this and it will happen because I know what it feels like to be both under authority and to have authority. How did we see, look at, look at what is happening here. Picture this, a Roman centurion who has pledged his allegiance to Caesar. Nothing comes above him. He's coming here to Jesus and he's saying, Lord. Note that the Jewish elders also didn't call him Lord in this, in this conversation. So for him to do this is a big deal. Secondly, we see that he definitely believes that Jesus has superior authority, that which doesn't require him to be physically in the same place. Even far away, say, go to the demons and they will leave. Authority not just for human flesh and blood, but over spirit and, and the principalities of demons and, and all of the spirit world, Jesus has authority over everything. Friends, we're living in a culture that is preaching autonomy to us time and again. We have all the authority. We are sovereign over ourselves. No one can tell us what to do. We do as we please. We live as if we have absolute authority over our work, our, our life, our family. But the centurion who came to Jesus has a different understanding of authority. Because rank-wise, he was placed in the middle of the chain. He had authority over him, so he knew what it means to carry out orders. He had both authority under him, servants under him, so he knows what it means to give orders. So, so for in their, in their context, Disobedience to any of your superior authority meant disobedience to Caesar straight. And that meant death. So Centurion had an understanding of what it means to be under authority. And friends, living in our culture, we don't. We don't. And, and look at what Jesus is doing here. He's doing something beautiful. He recognizes that the Centurion has has recognized his authority and he's giving a much bigger picture of his authority. Look at what he's saying. He's, he's moving on from just physical healing to a larger spiritual and, and salvation of all humanity sort of healing. He's saying, I tell you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table while the sons of the kingdom will, will be thrown into outer darkness. What he's saying is, since the Jews believed that they got their authority from being of this race, Jesus is telling them, no. Even the sons of this kingdom will be thrown into the darkness. I have authority. I have the power to save. So you don't need to be a son of the kingdom. You come from east and west. The moment you come to me and, and recognize me as your savior, come to me broken, shattered, recognize me as a savior, I will save you. Since the Jews believed this, Jesus is looking at them and saying, even the sons of the kingdom will go to, um, when, when the Bible talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth, it is referring to hell, an eternity of apart from God. Friends, why is this so important? Why is, this, why is this so important for us? What does it mean to us that Jesus has authority over all? What does it mean in the context of our conversations? It means two things. Firstly, entering this conversation, we need to go with the realization that we don't have the authority. Right? One of the reasons why we dislike having these conversations is because we don't have the authority over another person and tell them what you have to believe. And we don't have the absolute authority. They can say, Go to hell, man. I don't want to believe in this. And we don't like that. I don't like that. We don't have the authority. And it, it sucks that we can't control their response. We feel powerless. We are not in control. Evangelism is very humbling because of this. 
it's humbling for us followers of Jesus because we don't have the authority over who gets saved. Jesus does. I'm telling you from experience, my conversation with my friend when I was doing these questions, time and again during that conversation, I had my own agenda, right? I had a bunch of questions. I had to go through them. And I wanted favorable answers. I wanted some answers which I already had in my heart. And, and I wanted to steer the conversation in the name of facilitation to that direction. Constantly, I had to tell myself, shut up and listen. Shut up and listen. Give up your authority over this. Just surrender to what Jesus is doing. That's the first realization. We don't have the authority. Second, and I love this part. The second thing is, our explorer friends don't have the authority. One of the reasons why we are so afraid to have these faith conversations with our friends is because we know them. We know how strongly and fiercely they believe in what they believe in. We know we can already imagine all the pushbacks they can have to this conversation, right? But this passage is telling us and assuring us our friends do not have the ultimate authority over their hearts. Jesus does. What does this mean? Jesus will save whom he wants to save. He will override the sinful autonomous heart of man with his irresistible grace. So the pressure is off us. We don't need to be crushed. He will save whom he wants to save and no one, no one can stop it. So we approach the, conf the conversations with this confidence. Hey, I know that sometimes these conversations can look like me versus you, right? Uh, me trying to convince you and they trying to convince us. But both of this is wrong. As we approach these conversations, we approach them with a heart of surrender to Christ. When our hearts are surrendering to Christ, our friends see our hearts being surrendered to Christ. If they don't see surrender, why on earth will they surrender? Right? So this is the confidence that we approach the conversation with. So if Jesus really has all the authority, how does this help us? How does this help us? That's the third point we're going to be looking at today. How does his authority help us all? The same writer, Matthew, in verse in, in chapter 28, he's saying this. This is, this is the resurrected Jesus after, he's, uh, after he's, he's, he rose from the dead and, and he, he met with his disciples and he met with a lot of followers um, uh, during, during uh, this time and just before he ascends and goes back to heaven. Jesus is saying these last words to his disciples. This is what he's saying. He's saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Look at the immediate sentence. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. All authority has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. Hey, this is the resurrected Jesus. He, he, uh, and, and he's all, what he's saying is all of his authority, the product of all of his authority is in us, is channeled to us making disciples. Friends, shall we pause and grasp the magnitude of this? Shall we pause and grasp the ma magnitude of this? If all of Jesus' authority is working, and being channeled to us to make disciples, why is it still so hard? Why is it still so hard? The answer is quite simple, friends. We don't want to give up our own authority and surrender to Christ's. We don't want to do this. 
what does giving up our own, our own authority look like? If I have to be really honest, we're scared. What if I lose this friend? What if they reject me? What if they, or worse yet, what if they think I'm a fool? One of those fanatics who can't, who just can't seem to keep their faith private. This is a very real risk, friends. I mean, Christ has already given us a heads up. He didn't, he didn't just send us into the world. He gave us this heads up. Many will reject you, right? But this is giving up our authority. This is humbling ourselves. And we don't like to do this. Even though we know that Christ's authority is with us, I don't want to put down my authority and surrender. But friends, imagine and dream with me for a moment. What if the risk pays off? What if they really turn to Jesus? Hey, let me set our expectations right. It's not that in this one conversation they're going to say, I worship Jesus and this is it. No. What if this conversation breaks one of the hundreds of walls between them and Jesus? What if this risk pays off? And these conversations are meant to be open, non-threatening. It's a very inviting kind of conversation. Would you want to put down your own authority and surrender? It's okay, let's, let's try and take the risk. What if it pays off? The joy is indefinitely greater than the risk of being rejected and looking like a fool. The joy of our friend being saved for eternity. And friends, we will experience Christ's full authority only when we lay ours down. There can't be two things. When we lay our authority down, we'll experience Christ's authority. Hey, Jesus paved this path for us. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What is the joy? The joy is your and my salvation. Us being it, being eternally saved, eternally in the presence of God, enjoying all of his goodness, for that joy he endured the cross. He endured more scorn and shame that you and I will ever experience having these conversations. He endured it on your behalf and mine. Friends, what we're enjoying now is a result of Jesus doing this. Shall we take up the cross of possible shame and rejection for the joy of our friend's salvation? Shall we do this? Hey, who can we take time to talk to this week? Who can we take time to talk to this week? Make it a real conversation and go in in a humble posture, knowing that Christ has all authority. If you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, hey, you might feel like all of this is foreign. I don't, I don't feel like the insider. Look at what Jesus is saying here. You don't need to be a son of the kingdom. The centurion was not a son of the kingdom. Come to me as you are. And things Jesus says, I will come and heal you. Yeah, I don't know what you're going through today. I mean, it might not be a physical thing. It might be a deep emotional hurt, deep emotional wound that you're carrying. I don't know what you're going through. Would you come to Jesus as you are? He wants to heal you. He wants to embrace you this morning. Allow me to just pray and close. Jesus, thank you for um, really trusting us with the Great Commission. I mean, I wouldn't put myself for the job, but we have your power and you said you will be with us throughout the end of age, up until you come. Thank you, Lord. Help us 
to look at this as a privilege would you heal the indifference in our hearts would you heal our hearts which always want to be in control thereby throwing us off and and pushing us far off from having these real conversations conversations where we might come out being fools or or come out being rejected lord would you heal that need for authority and control in our hearts and help us surrender to jesus help us surrender even as we go into the world and have these real conversations help us lord help us in your name we pray jesus amen